thank you all for joining today's webinar. If you're having technical issues and need support, please message the panelists via chat and we can assist you. A reminder that the session is being recorded. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will distribute the recording to all registered participants via email. The recording or edited versions may be made available to the Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard University community and to the broader public via edX, the internet, social media, or other means. It's also possible that portions of this recording may be used to make other derivative works in the future. Participants may elect not to take part in the recording project and still participate in the webinar by submitting your questions via the Q&A function anonymously. Please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function throughout the presentation, and we will save time at the end to address as many as we can. Thank you for joining us for today's session, A Darkening Horizon, Nuclear Dangers Around the World with Professor Matthew Bunn, presented by Harvard Kennedy School Executive Education. Matthew Bunn is the James R. Schlesinger Professor of the Practice of Energy, National Security, and Foreign Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. His research in interests include nuclear deterrence and arm control, nuclear theft and terrorism, nuclear proliferation and measures to control it, the future of nuclear energy and its fuel cycle, and innovation in energy technologies. Before coming to Harvard, Bunn served as an advisor to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as a study director at the National Academy of Sciences, and as editor of Arms Control Today. He is the author or co-author of more than 25 books or major, major technical reports, most recently revitalizing nuclear security in an era of uncertainty, and over 150 articles and publications ranging from science to the Washington Post. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt, with this important topic, over to you. Well, thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, in this moment of uh, unthinkable madness uh, taking place in Israel and Palestine uh, with uh, very much non-nuclear weapons, it remains nonetheless important to think about conflict uh, around the world and especially conflicts that could lead to nuclear use. So I'm gonna be talking about somewhat depressing topics, but I promise toward the end that there will be some good news uh, about nuclear weapons uh, as well. So let me just start by highlighting uh, the effect of a single nuclear weapon. This is uh, Nagasaki in September of 1945 after uh, the US bombing. And I would note that the vast majority of the nuclear weapons in the world today are dramatically more powerful than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, typically uh, 10 times or more greater in power. Um, now, when I think back to a decade ago, uh, the nuclear horizon really has darkened dramatically. Um, we have seen, uh, compared to 10 years ago, radically increased hostility between between the United States and Russia, between the United States and China, especially because of the war in Ukraine uh, and lately repeated Russian nuclear threats, which I'll mention more in a moment. We've seen uh, substantially increased doubts over US leadership, uh, both in the Trump administration and the Biden administration and increased anxiety among US allies. Uh, we've seen really dramatic advances in technology ranging from uh, improved missile defenses to artificial intelligence and a wide range of other things that at a minimum complicate nuclear balances and may make them more dangerous. There's a large expansion of Chinese nuclear forces underway, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And the whole infrastructure of arms control and measures to reduce nuclear risks has been greatly weakened with uh, violations leading to US withdrawal from some key treaties, almost all of the key communications, including military to military communications cut off between the United States and Russia and the, largely the United States and China. Uh, and the last remaining agreement limiting US and Russian nuclear forces, the New START Treaty, expires in February of 2026. And currently there are no talks underway uh, to replace it. Meanwhile, the North Korean uh, nuclear and missile arsenals are growing dramatically. 
There is a huge increase in Iranian nuclear capabilities following President Trump's pullout from the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, also an expanded missile force from Iran and ongoing support for armed groups throughout the Middle East, uh, an ongoing competition between Pakistan and India, ongoing nuclear terrorist threats, which some of us may have forgotten about with the uh, demise of the uh, large capabilities that Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State once had, uh, but there's still an ongoing uh, danger there. Uh, there's increased tensions between states that have nuclear weapons and those that don't, uh, and there's probably ongoing and even expanding obstacles to making any progress toward getting rid of nuclear weapons in the long term. Now, in particular, Russia's war on Ukraine really upends a lot of the international order on which nuclear order is based. You have a founding member of the United Nations, a permanent member of the Security Council, whose job is to protect international peace and security, being the one to wage large-scale aggressive war, exactly what the United Nations was founded to prevent, and using nuclear threats as the shield behind which to wield the conventional sword. You have Ukraine, which gave up the nuclear weapons left on its soil when the Soviet Union collapsed in return for assurances that its sovereignty would not be threatened and they would not be attacked, being torn apart by one of the states that offered those assurances. And you have global impacts on uh, security, but also on food, energy, uh, and other issues. Meanwhile, US and Russian talks have been largely cut off as a result of all this. This requires us to rethink a lot of areas of nuclear policy. With a Russia that is more aggrieved and more willing to use force and violence and to rattle the nuclear saber, we need to think again about how best to implement nuclear deterrence. Uh, Russia will have weakened conventional forces when this is all over and will likely be even more dependent on nuclear weapons than before. And US allies want even stronger assurances than they had before that they will be protected. The future of nuclear arms control is in doubt, as I mentioned, with the last treaty uh, potentially soon to expire. The future of nuclear nonproliferation is quite uncertain, uh, partly because Ukraine's fate, having given up the nuclear weapons on its soil, may lead other countries to think, gee, maybe that was a mistake for Ukraine. Uh, maybe I need nuclear weapons of my own. And it requires us to rethink nuclear energy, nuclear safety, and nuclear security, given that Ukraine's nuclear power plants, and especially the one in Zaporizhia, have been operating in the midst of an ongoing war, and the one in Zaporizhia seized by Russian forces. And so we have to think about these things with the possibility that nuclear facilities might be exposed to war, to mass social unrest, to the collapse of the state. These are things we haven't really thought about in nuclear safety and security in the past. So let me go back, first of all, 60 years to give you uh, a feel for the kind of things that can happen. This is one particular incident of several during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the tale of the B-59 submarine. Now this was a diesel submarine, these days they would be nuclear powered, but it was a diesel submarine and it was designed to operate up in Arctic waters north of Russia, not in the Caribbean. And so its air conditioning was terrible uh, and that it hadn't been able to surface to get more air for days because it was being chased by the US Navy. It was more than 110 degrees on board, carbon dioxide was high, people were literally passing out from lack of oxygen Although the US Navy didn't know it, that sub was armed with a nuclear torpedo. Uh, and they thought on the submarine that war had already broken out because they'd been out of contact with Moscow for days. And the US Navy was dropping what the US Navy thought of as practice depth charges, 
but it sounded like you know explosions when you're inside a metal tube. They were explosions when you're inside a metal tube under the water. So the captain of the submarine ordered that the nuclear torpedo be readied for firing. And as it happens, out of complete random chance, the chief of staff of that group of submarines happened to be on board that particular one, Captain Vasily Arkhipov. Uh, and he countermanded the order and prevented the use of that nuclear weapon. Had he not done so, had he not been there, we might not be having this conversation today. So the fog of crisis can very much lead to disaster. And that even though consciously deciding to launch a large scale nuclear war is very hard to imagine given the unbelievable consequences uh, that the state that launched such a war would likely face. But the crises of the nuclear age uh, and pre-nuclear wars, such as the outbreak of World War I, highlight the dangers of ways conflicts can escalate in ways that weren't intended originally by the leaders involved, accidents, miscalculations. Uh, and what's more, in a nuclear age, leaders might believe that they could get away with using nuclear weapons in a limited way and deter a devastating response, and that that might solve a military problem that they were facing. Talk about that more in a moment. Meanwhile, new technologies may be making the stability of these deterrent balances even more problematic. Uh, with missile defenses, with cyber, with counter space, uh, they all make new complexity. Cyber in particular, blurs the lines between peace and conflict. Uh, with conventional weapons, you know when a shell goes across a border or a soldier uh, walks across a border. With cyber, adversaries are in each other's computer systems all day long, every day, anyway. And sometimes computers get infected that weren't part of the original targets at all. Um, I'm sure that Stuxnet in, uh, infected many more computers than was originally intended by whoever created it. And similarly, uh, the uh, NotPetya uh, attack uh, infected uh, many uh, people that weren't originally intended. Uh, counter space and cyber may both create incentives to hit first and to hit early in a conflict. Missile defenses are complicating strategic plan planning. And these days, nuclear and conventional forces are often mixed together. The same missiles can launch a conventional warhead or a nuclear warhead, and the same command and control is used for both. Uh, and AI may lead to greater time pressure, uh, may lead to decisions based on incorrect information, uh, so we have a lot of new issues that we need to address. Meanwhile, just looking at Russia in particular, let's start doing our tour of the horizon. Starting with Russia, we have aggressive war in Ukraine. Even before that, a quite aggressive uh, nuclear modernization with new types of weapons, uh, fairly aggressive nuclear exercises, cyber attacks, election interference on the United States. We have a level of tension between the United States and Russia that hasn't existed since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Russian nuclear forces are fairly vulnerable, leading them to put them on launch on warning or launch under attack with decisions that would have to be made in minutes. Um, arms control, as I mentioned, is in crisis. Uh, and so we have uh, real dangers arising from the basic structure of Russia's nuclear forces and command and control. Uh, then there's the question of would they choose to use nuclear weapons, perhaps in a limited way, in the Ukraine war? This is a real debate among serious Russian uh, strategists at the moment. Uh, one person who we have personally hosted at the Belfer Center in the past has been loudly arguing uh, for limited nuclear strikes on NATO, um, as one example. 
Uh, Russian leaders might think they could break Castelny or stop a Ukrainian breakthrough, or uh, what they've been talking about more is ending NATO's support for Ukraine by using nuclear weapons. They might use them to destroy armored formations that were breaking through uh, to threaten cities. Uh, Putin has more than once referred to the, quote, precedent, unquote, that the United States set by attacking Hiroshima and Nagasaki and then demanding that Japan surrender. But what they've been talking about more is that the even riskier step of using them against NATO countries um, uh, in their view to force NATO to back down. Um, now, Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has threatened that any nuclear use in Ukraine or against NATO would result in a response that would be, quote, catastrophic, unquote, for Russia. But some in Russia think the United States is bluffing, um, and they think they might be able to deter substantial retaliation. So there's real potential for a horrifying uh, misperception and mistake. China has a much smaller nuclear force than Russia, but a major military modernization underway, nuclear modernization underway. A few years ago, they had uh, only about 200 nuclear weapons. Now they have about 400, and it's still heading upwards. Uh, the US Defense Department thinks by 2035, they may have 1,500, which is uh, smaller than the current US total nuclear arsenal, but comparable to the number of deployed strategic weapons the United States uh, has uh, in operation at the moment. They're building hundreds of new nuclear missile silos. Uh, and uh, there's, as I mentioned, really serious tensions between the United States and China, particularly over Taiwan, which uh, there are some indications that she personally has made it part of his goal of his tenure to reunify uh, China with Taiwan. Um, and there's, with China, no arms control in place, no verification of their forces, no dialogue on the strategic issues that concern each of us. Uh, China is concerned over U.S., capabilities, in particular U.S. capabilities to strike Chinese forces and to defend against any remaining forces. North Korea is led by an unpredictable dictator. They now have dozens of nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles. Um, they have been engaged in a remarkable flurry of missile testing at a pace higher than any country in memory. Um, they may carry out an additional nuclear test at any time. They've been preparing their nuclear test site. By the way, there have also been important uh, activities at both the Chinese nuclear test site and the Russian nuclear test site. Uh, they have a history of provocations against the Republic of Korea that could lead to conflict. And the United States has tried hard, it's tried soft, uh, nothing that we have done over the years has succeeded for the long term in preventing getting to where we are now. And there's no clear prospects for the oft discussed denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So imagine a potential conflict scenario there. Let's imagine the North Koreans do something awful again. They shell an island or something like that. South Korea might insist on striking back to reestablish deterrence of further North Korean actions. North Korea might misinterpret that as the beginning of a major uh, attack on North Korea and use a handful of conventional missiles against one of the US air bases supporting air operations in such a campaign. Well, our doctrine, if we see the North Koreans getting ready to use their missiles is to try to take all those missiles out in a doctrine referred to as kill chain. Uh, that would put the DPRK, that is North Korea, under severe pressure to use its weapons or lose them uh, to the American and ROK strikes. And it might look a good deal like the air campaign that was the prelude to a major invasion of North Korea. And North Korea might conclude 
that not only that it could use a few nuclear weapons on American uh, bases and ports in Korea and the surrounding area and hold the rest in reserve to deter a retaliation. And that might not be what would lead to the end of their regime, but rather the only way to save their regime. They'd be wrong, but they might believe that. South Asia, we have a, a ongoing nuclear arms race between countries that have fought four wars. It's been going on for decades. Uh, they have military doctrines with somewhat unclear red lines and terrorists who uh, could um, have shown in the past a desire to provoke conflict. So you could imagine that they would blunder into war. Although, to be fair, they have managed recent crises successfully uh, and managed to de-escalate without having a major conflict after recent crises. Um, Pakistan has a growing nuclear arsenal, some of the world's most capable terrorists, and some modeling suggests even Indo-Pakistani nuclear war could cause uh, enough smoke to go up into the upper atmosphere that it would interfere with agriculture throughout the Northern Hemisphere uh, and potentially put hundreds of millions of people at risk of starvation. Meanwhile, in Iran, uh, the nuclear agreement that it reached with uh, all of the P5 countries and Europe uh, did reduce risk, but it fell apart when uh, President Trump pulled the United States out of it. And Iran is now right at the edge of a nuclear weapons capability. They have the ability to produce several bombs worth of nuclear material in days, potentially faster than they could be stopped. Um, and they continue to support terrorist groups in the region, uh, including Hamas that has carried out the awful attacks of recent days. They continue to threaten Israel, test long range ballistic missiles, and they've never given a, an honest declaration of their past nuclear weapons efforts. In fact, there's a major dispute uh, between them and the International Atomic Energy Agency where Iran continues to lie about why there were nuclear particles found at some key uh, sites from its past nuclear program. So we don't really know what's the future for Iran's program. Nonetheless, the uh, efforts to stem the spread of nuclear weapons have been surprisingly successful over the decades. Uh, there's been no net increase in nuclear armed states in three and a half decades. We added North Korea, but subtracted South Africa. It's admittedly a terrible trade, but to have no net increase over a time that included all the chaos following the collapse of the Soviet Union, secret nuclear weapons programs in North Korea, Iran, Syria, Libya, Iraq, uh, a global black market network selling the technologies of choice for the determined nuclear cheater led by Pakistan's AQ Khan. It's an amazing public policy success story. All but five of the states in the world are parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's never been true in human history before that our most powerful weapon we had available was so widely forsworn. Uh, it is a little puzzling why uh, this effort has been so successful. For much of its existence, the NPT had pretty weak verification and very little enforcement. But most states realize they're better off without nuclear weapons if that means their neighbors also don't have nuclear weapons. And the treaty changes the internal decision-making of states. It means more people and different people will be involved in the decision. Uh, and that tends to uh, change how the decision will come out. And for most states, having made a public decision to ratify a treaty saying you won't get nuclear weapons means that a decision to get nuclear weapons requires overturning past policy, which in most states is harder than making a new policy where there wasn't any policy before. Um, it also creates a norm that makes it much easier to organize uh, coalitions against new nuclear weapons programs. But the regime is under increasing pressure. Many of the states without nuclear weapons are very unhappy the 
treaty called for the nuclear armed states to negotiate in good faith toward disarmament. And it's been more than 50 years now without disarmament happening. And many of the non-nuclear weapon states are quite unhappy about it. They have negotiated a treaty banning all nuclear weapons without any of the states that actually have any nuclear weapons paying any attention to it. And that's one symbol of the friction that's ongoing. And meanwhile, modified technologies and the spread of nuclear energy could also add to the risk. But there is some substantial good news to be had. First of all, we've had 78 years now with no nuclear attacks. That is an amazing success that in 1945, no one would have predicted. Uh, more than four fifths of all the nuclear weapons that once existed in the world have been eliminated. Uh, less than 5% of the states in the world have nuclear weapons. And as I mentioned, that's the same number as 35 years ago. So uh, we're uh, making some serious progress in uh, limiting the spread of nuclear weapons. In fact, more than half of the states that once started nuclear weapons programs decided to give them up. Uh, so our efforts to prevent proliferation succeed more often than they fail. Moreover, there used to be at little research reactors and so on, material that potentially terrorists could steal to make a nuclear bomb all over the place. Uh, my hometown, the next town upstream from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Watertown, Massachusetts, used to have a nuclear reactor powered with weapon grade high leverage uranium, uh, believe it or not. Um, 50% of the states that used to have that material have gotten rid of it. Uh, and the remaining stuff is way more secure than it was a quarter century ago, just night and day more secure. So it's much harder for terrorists to get their hands on it than it once was. What's more, although the picture looks very dark at the moment, it's worth remembering that it looked very dark in 1983 when the Soviets walked out of all arms control negotiations. But that turned out to be the prelude to the beginning of real nuclear arms reductions that uh, really got going a couple of years after that. And both the United States and Russia have strong incentives not to get into a really unrestrained arms competition with each other. So it's my hope that when the Ukraine war ends, new opportunities may open up, even if it's hard to imagine a treaty that both Vladimir Putin and two thirds of the US Senate will accept, we may be able to use other means, uh, political commitments, unilateral reciprocal initiatives, executive agreements to make progress. And even though China is rejecting any participation in arms control for now, they also have good reasons to want to avoid a completely unregulated arms race. And if the United States makes the right offers and China makes the right decisions, they may decide to join a, a different kind of process uh, in the future. And there's still a variety of risk reduction measures and I and various others continue to participate in non-government dialogues where we're developing and stockpiling ideas for the next rounds of arms control that can be picked up when governments are ready. And already governments have picked up some of these ideas. There are some ideas that we developed in our academy to academy dialogue through the national academies with the Russians that it appears even the Trump administration uh, picked up uh, in the last uh, administration. So if you think about it, and how do we think about reducing the danger of nuclear war? You really wanna think through all of the potential steps that might lead to a nuclear exchange. You start from peace. Uh, you, you're not very likely gonna have a, a nuclear attack as a bolt from the blue. It's gonna arise out of some crisis or conflict. So peace then goes to a crisis an intense militarized crisis between nuclear armed states, which then potentially escalates to conflict, which then potentially escalates to nuclear use. And you can think through how to reduce the danger of each of those steps 
occurring. The key and most important step is preventing major crises between nuclear armed states in the first place. Uh, because the lesson again is that there's a fog of crisis that's very difficult to control. And, but we do also have to think about how to de-escalate once we're already in a crisis. How do we reassure the adversary that we're not trying to destroy them? How do we reach resolutions in the atmosphere of hatred and fear and misperception and very shortness of time that will exist uh, when a major nuclear crisis is underway? So to deal with all of these challenges, uh, a year ago, uh, my team at Harvard with support from the MacArthur Foundation launched a global research network on the theme of rethinking nuclear deterrence. It needs to be rethought because it's always involved terrible dangers and moral quandaries, uh, but also because of the changing geopolitics and changing technologies that I mentioned. We need new ideas to address some of these changing dangers. So we've put together a network that involves scholars and practitioners from more than 25 countries uh, in four working groups. One on preventing nuclear war that uh, I am co-chairing with a colleague from India. Uh, one on the legal and ethical aspects of nuclear deterrence. One on evolving technologies and arms control. And one on uh, are there pathways to get beyond relying on nuclear deterrence. We've got a variety of other projects as well outside the working groups, um, uh, but I think I will leave it there and open it up to questions. Thanks for listening. Oh, Thanks. wait, I have one more slide. Oh. Never mind. Uh, and that is the importance of presidential judgment. We are all very dependent on the good judgment of the leaders of states armed with nuclear weapons. And in the Cuban Missile crisis, had Kennedy taken the option that his advisors were pressing on him in the early days and that he himself supported in the early days, again, we might not be having this conversation uh, because the initial option was airstrikes followed by an invasion. And we now know, as Kennedy's team didn't, that the Soviet Union already had tactical nuclear weapons ready to go to defend those missiles. So we managed to make it through the Cuban Missile Crisis. And for Kennedy, the key lesson was to always give the adversary some face saving way out, some choice between humiliating defeat and nuclear war. And that's a, a very difficult judgment to maintain in the middle of an incredible crisis. And we really rely on that kind of sober judgment, which may be in short supply in some of the nuclear armed states today or in the future. So with that, I will actually turn it to questions. Apologies for uh, forgetting about that last mm -hmm. slide. Great, thank you so much. Um, you can submit your questions via the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can. Um, we had a question uh, in the chat asking, uh, aren't we seeing a world where the crisis period is shortening or disappearing and situations are jumping almost directly to conflict, uh, such as with Israel and Hamas and Russia and Ukraine? So I think that uh, there are situations, whoops, uh, where uh, it does uh, go directly to conflict. Um, but I think that's not always the case by any means. Um, I, think it is, I think it is very likely that uh, a, a nuclear armed state uh, wishing to challenge an interest that it knew was important to another nuclear armed state would not start with uh, a massive attack uh, because uh, they would know that there would be an enormous risk of a massive retaliation in response or a devastating retaliation in response. Uh, they would try to get their objectives uh, without getting into a large-scale nuclear war. For example, if I had to guess, and this is purely a guess, a Chinese challenge to Taiwan might start as the United States did in the Cuban Missile Crisis with a blockade, um, rather than with you know 
immediately starting with mass missile attacks on uh, US aircraft carrier battle groups, for example. Uh, uh, so I, I think states, the major powers in any case, will try to avoid getting into major shooting wars with each other right from the start. Great. Um, we have a question about the age of the U.S. nuclear weapons. What about the advanced US, age of U.S. nuclear weapons when compared to Russia's modernized stockpile and China's newly manufactured weapons? So the nuclear weapons of the United States are fairly old, but there is a major modernization program uh, underway. And the United States has long had a uh, stockpile stewardship program for the weapons themselves. Uh, that allows us to understand the weapons and their performance and uh, current state uh, actually better than we understood it when uh, the United States was carrying out full-scale nuclear testing uh, because we have uh, more advanced science and computers uh, and uh, analyses than we had uh, back in those days. Um, for the missiles, uh, we do full-scale testing, uh, you know, firing them uh, across the Pacific uh, to uh, Pacific atolls. Um, and similarly, the bombers are flown regularly. So we understand fully uh, the capabilities uh, of the US arsenal, which remain uh, extremely robust uh, and effective. Uh, nonetheless, a uh, dramatic modernization is underway uh, it is really the first time that in U.S. history that a nuclear modernization costing over a trillion dollars is underway with almost no public debate and no accompanying arms control component. It used to be that presidents wanting to build up nuclear weapons uh, in order to get support from the Congress needed to have an arms control component to show they weren't just crazy arms racers. and. Uh, presidents wanting to pursue arms control needed to have a nuclear modernization component to their program to show that they weren't giving away the store uh, to potential adversaries. Uh, this is really the first time it's been sort of one without the other because the United States doesn't have a partner interested in arms control at the moment. Uh, Vladimir Putin has violated multiple agreements and is now violating the New START Treaty by refusing to continue inspections, although both sides are remaining under the core limits of the treaty. And um, we have a question about technology. Uh, so while technology seems to weaken nuclear stability, can you point out aspects in which technology may offer stabilizing effects? Absolutely. There may be a variety of ways in which uh, technology may offer stabilizing effects. Um, uh, in particular, uh, I would argue that AI, while it may have a variety of destabilizing effects, may also really strengthen verification uh, in a variety of ways, allowing uh, search through vast quantities of data, images, et cetera, to find changes early. Uh, I think we may be in a world where uh, verification becomes uh, significantly uh, stronger than it has been uh, in the past. Um, uh, it's also the case that, for example, things like uh, missile defenses, uh, there are those uh, who, including myself, who have argued that missile defenses are destabilizing because any uh, wide-scale defense will work better against a ragged, disorganized retaliation that you know is coming after launching a first strike, then they will against a surprise nuclear first strike and therefore will aid the first striker more than the defender. There is a counter argument though, that trying to launch a first strike in the presence of missile defenses where you don't really know which of your warheads are gonna make it to the targets that they're targeting, uh, is way more complicated and uncertain and therefore will deter uh, any such uh, first strike attack. Uh, my colleague, Will Toby, who I uh, co-taught with for a decade after he left the Bush administration, um, uh, and I uh, had those uh, contrasting 
views. And we talk together both to give our students a broader perspective and to model the kind of bipartisan cooperation that used to exist in the United States and remains, I think, necessary for a long-term approach to US national security. Thank you. Um, how do we address the question from the rest of the world that the US and the West see them, themselves as responsible and justified in holding these weapons, but why should they be permitted to have them, um, to even use them at the end of World War II? How do we put ourselves in the shoes of those who don't see the US as saints? So I think it's very important for the nuclear armed states to listen to the voices of the non-nuclear armed states. Uh, and the non-nuclear armed states, of course, are not uh, a monolith either. Uh, there are non-nuclear states that rely very heavily on the U.S. nuclear arsenal for their security. Uh, but there are also non-nuclear states who believe uh, that nuclear weapons are fundamentally immoral, illegitimate. And that was the uh, driving idea behind the nuclear weapons ban treaty. Um, Unfortunately, I don't see any plausible path in the next decade or two to get to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, we need to listen to the moral and ethical arguments about nuclear weapons, but if we want to influence the states that actually have nuclear weapons to move in the direction of disarmament, we have to build the case that that would actually be a more secure world for them uh, and they would be better off overall uh, than they are maintaining their nuclear weapons. And for better or for worse, none of the states with nuclear weapons believes that today. Uh, so I think there are, I remain optimistic that there may be ways uh, to build up structures of security and approaches to international affairs that make getting rid of nuclear weapons possible. But that isn't the world we're living in right now today. Thanks. Um, we have a question. What do you think is the most important factor in explaining why so many countries have foregone nuclear weapons? Is it security concerns, such as avoiding an arms race and being a target, or normative concerns, such as honoring agreements, reputation, et cetera? It's a great question. Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, the uh, international community doesn't fully understand it. Um, realists in international affairs uh, have long predicted that uh, nuclear weapons would spread everywhere. Uh, they, in principle, make if you have a survivable arsenal, it makes your state unconquerable. And if the fundamental job of a state is to survive, everybody ought to have nuclear, ought to want nuclear weapons. And so realists have had a very hard time explaining uh, why most states have not attempted to get nuclear weapons. And in particular, many of the states that in theory, at least just looking at the structure of the system as opposed to the actual relations between states are most threatened, uh, never even attempted to get nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, in Europe, the state sitting right on the Soviet Union's border with no allies to protect it, uh, Finland never bothered to have a nuclear weapons program, uh, had been invaded by the Soviet Union, and I can go on. Uh, the most important factor in my view is simply that most states don't have a security problem for which nuclear weapons are a plausible answer. Um, most states are not especially worried about a large scale invasion by their neighbor. Um, they are worried about various uh, you know, border disputes, uh, internal uh, security issues, uh, and so on. Um, secondly, I think the United States and the Soviet Union, as the sort of co-hegemons long ago, uh, understood that it would be better for them if the power of nuclear weapons was not widely uh, dispersed. And uh, they were able to uh, convince uh, their allies and many other countries to join up uh, to the agreement, especially since third, there was a genuine fear, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis of nuclear war. And almost everybody understood 
that more fingers on the button meant more danger that the button would get pushed. Uh, and so there was very widespread support for a treaty banning the spread of nuclear weapons. It was uh, a, a vote of the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly uh, called for such a treaty. And the fact that the treaty is participated in by almost all of the states in the world suggests that that view is still very widely held that you know, fewer states with nuclear weapons is better for everyone than more states with nuclear weapons. It is a discriminatory treaty. It says a few states are allowed to have them for the time being and other states are not. But overall, everyone on earth has a lower chance of being incinerated with a nuclear bomb because a treaty banning the spread of nuclear weapons and a whole regime around it to make it effective exist. Thank you. And um, we have a question about uh, non-state actors. So what extent should be, we be concerned about larger violent non-state actors or terrorist organizations, such as the drug trafficking organizations in Latin America or Hezbollah obtaining nuclear material and their capacity to construct a basic nuclear device? Well, this has been the subject of, I would say the majority of my career has been worrying about exactly that. Uh, I would say there's the vast majority of terrorist groups are not remotely interested in the nuclear level of violence. They are attempting to uh, seize political power in particular local areas uh, and nuclear violence would be uh, contradictory to, uh, would actually undermine their support and their political aims. Um, it's a few groups with global ambitions um, or uh, millennial or nihilist views that you really have to worry about. And in particular, in recent years, uh, Al Qaeda had a serious and focused nuclear weapons program uh, that got as far uh, in the months before the 9-11 attacks as, as carrying out some crude but sensible uh, conventional explosive tests in the Afghan desert of their uh, proposed nuclear device. Um, we have much less evidence of any Islamic State uh, effort, but if there had been an Islamic State effort, there they had more people, more money, more territory under control, more ability to recruit experts globally than Al Qaeda ever had. Um, uh, so uh, we have those issues. Uh, but we shouldn't think that it's exclusively Islamists who might go in that direction. Uh, uh, other groups might go in that direction as well. Long ago, in the mid-90s, there was a terror cult in Japan uh, known as Am Shinrikyo uh, that also pursued nuclear weapons and chemical weapons and biological weapons and carried out a nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subways. Uh, so uh, we need a focused effort to build and maintain high levels of security for all the nuclear facilities around the world, and especially all the places where there are nuclear weapons or the material needed to make a crude nuclear bomb. Uh, we have a question about uh, the use of AI. So with computational modeling and AI becoming more prominent in decision-making processes, what work is being done to understand this interplay, particularly to prevent us from being too far down the river to row back when misguided by such tools? Uh, I wish I could report more brilliant work being done. Um, there is work being done, uh, some by uh, NGOs who, um, uh, may know a good bit about AI, but some of them know uh, relatively modest amount about nuclear command and control and nuclear weapons. Uh, some by government agencies that know a good bit about nuclear weapons and much less about the uh, potential advances that uh, are coming out of the private sector on AI. I think there's more uh, real thinking that needs to be done. And part of it Part of the difficulty, of course, is that progress in AI is happening so quickly 
that it's hard to really understand where will we be five years from now, 10 years from now. And nuclear weapons planning, uh, because of the long time horizons to build you know, nuclear submarines, nuclear bombers, nuclear missiles, is on a sort of decades long uh, time horizon. Uh, there are many, many different things to think about, ranging from whether AI will make hidden weapons like uh, undersea submarines more vulnerable uh, to whether, uh, as the question asks, decision-making will somehow be uh, distorted or manipulated or uh, have uh, timelines shortened even more uh, or certain decisions that aren't judged to be nuclear decisions, but nonetheless contribute to escalation given over to machines. Uh, there's a lot of issues there that need to be addressed. In some of these track two dialogues, we've started discussing these kinds of things with Russian colleagues, Chinese colleagues, um, but the, I would say it's only at the very beginning. Uh, could you expound on the nuclear winter concept and what approximate level of nuclear exchange would trigger such an event? Do the effects generally stay within the hemisphere in which the weapons are exchanged? So uh, it's a good question, and uh, it would take uh, hours to go through it in detail. But uh, I will say there is uh, a Google will turn up a, a good bit of high quality recent uh, scientific analysis of this. The basic concept is not that nuclear explosions would raise so much dirt and so on up into the upper atmosphere as to cause a nuclear winter. It's the smoke uh, from burning cities that would really uh, have potentially the relevant effect. Now there is debate. Uh, there are analyses that suggest that even attacks on say, uh, with the use of say a hundred moderate sized nuclear weapons on cities could uh, put up enough smoke into the upper atmosphere to interfere with um, agriculture throughout the Northern hemisphere and would start leaking actually down into the Southern hemisphere. There's, you know, there's no wall in between the Northern and Southern hemispheres, but the, the primary effect would be in the Northern hemisphere, just based on where the nuclear armed countries are. Um, uh, that would interfere with agriculture for years, uh, potentially cause global famines. Uh, a a large-scale nuclear exchange in those same uh, climate models, uh, you know, conceivably has the potential for destroying uh, much of life on Earth. Um, uh, now. Um, there are people who disagree. There are models that say the effect would be much more modest. Congress has asked the National Academies to do a uh, assessment of the science. Uh, one huge uncertainty is just, of course, we don't know how much smoke gets created when you drop a nuclear weapon on a modern city. Nobody's ever done it. Um, certainly, um, you know, when Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, nobody was using uh, careful instrumentation to measure how much smoke went how high in the atmosphere with what particle sizes, et cetera. Um, and so the, the basic issue of uh, how much smoke is there gonna be and how high is it gonna rise um, is a, an uncertainty that is to a certain extent irreducible. There are, sort of natural models from large forest fires and so on, but one has to be careful about how different those are from burning a large city. Uh, we have a question about nuclear facilities and conflict zones. Um, what do you recommend governments or the IAEA do to make nuclear facilities less vulnerable to shelling, occupation, or being used as a tactical element on the battlefield? So I think there's a lot to be done and a lot of thinking still to be done. Um, one thing we see for sure in the case of Zaporizhia is that various things that are quite important to safety in such a situation are not among the things uh, 
that we have previously considered to be part of the vital areas, quote unquote, of the plant, like the electricity cables going into the plant and so on. Um, I think it's important to make a distinction between things that might happen inadvertently in the course of a conflict, a stray shell hitting a plant, you know, some machine gun bullets hitting a plant, the electricity getting cut off, the uh, communications with uh, central headquarters getting cut off, uh, staff not being able to rotate in and out for a couple of weeks, and intentional military efforts to cause a major release at the plant. I think it's reasonable for governments to consider uh, whether to ask operators to be a bit better prepared uh, to prevent uh, a major release in the event of the inadvertent things happening. But it is an operator's job to defend against, you know, a major military force attacking the plant and, uh, and trying to destroy it. That's the government's job. Now, governments may have to think again about how to do that job, uh, but that shouldn't be up to the operators. But there are some simple things that might be done. Uh, the Australian research reactor, just to take one example, has a big steel cage over the top of it. That would make it a lot harder for a stray shell to get through to the actual roof of the reactor or for a drone to get through to the actual roof of the reactor. Um, so there are things like that that probably wouldn't cost very much money. Uh, you know, you can make sure you have a couple of weeks worth of food and water and cots and so on for the staff in case, uh, you know, they have to stay for a while, for example. Uh, uh, so uh, there's a lot to be done. Um, uh, a lot of it may require some policy change. Right now, the global legal norms uh, are quite weak. And that's partly because the United States itself is one of the countries that has opposed banning attacks on nuclear facilities uh, because it wants to keep its options open for uh, military options to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, I would argue that in for the subset of facilities where a uh, release could cause a really huge disaster and they're operating and they're under international atomic energy and safeguards, we ought to agree on a ban on attacking facilities for that subset of facilities. Okay, thank you. We are just about at the end, um, but one more question before we go. We've had a couple of questions um, relating to public awareness and public risk perception about nuclear weapons. Um, how does broader public risk perception impact potential nuclear weapons use? Um, this person here is suggesting that people are now reading more books about AI being an existential threat than nuclear weapons. So do you think that reduced fear has increased the danger of them being used? The public's role is quite important, but indirect. Um, the time when the public can really make a difference on the policies of nuclear armed states is when the public is so concerned that it, they're willing to exert political power. In the freeze movement in 1982, there were a million people on the streets of New York City protesting uh, nuclear weapons. And that did have an effect on government policy. Uh, today, if people are out protesting, it's over climate, it's over racial injustice and economic injustice. It, it's not over uh, nuclear weapons. And so the ability of the public to really influence the outcome uh, is more limited because the public is not as concerned about nuclear weapons. And I I am not uh, a great expert on mobilizing uh, masses of humanity. Uh, so I don't personally have a good solution uh, to that problem. Right now, for better or for worse, this is being fought out largely at the expert level um, within governments. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you'll join us on November 8th for the next webinar in our series, The Science Behind Generative AI with Professor Sherrod Goel.
Thank you for your questions. We got to many of them. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more, but thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Be well, everyone. Take care. Thanks for coming.